Eh, estamos en esta oportunidad con el doctor Mark Gaylan. Él es anatomo patólogo de la Universidad de Rutgers, eh, New Jersey Medical School. So we think uh, here um, by our experience in Peru that your work as anatomo pathologist is very important one. Uh, new diseases, uh, uh, new structures have been found by pathologists. The problem that we have here is like uh, we don't have uh, too many autopsies. People believe uh, that there's a harm for their relatives. Do you have this problem of aut autopsies in your your country? Uh, the number of autopsies we do in, at American hospitals has declined greatly mm -hmm. over you know the past even you know 20 years or so. Um, it's a combination of things. Partly it's because of um, monetary issues. Mm -hmm. um, partly it's because people are, are often unwilling to provide consent for autopsies for, the, autopsies for their loved ones, which is completely understandable. But also there's a feeling nowadays that given the advances in medical science, that there is less and less to be learned from doing an autopsy. That you know, we know so much about medicine that doing an autopsy is not going to teach us any more about what was going on in the, with the patient. But the truth is, and they've studied this, that we still find important things on autopsies. Sometimes they had a direct bearing on the patient's death, and sometimes they were not closely related, but still very important things to have known. So the percentage of cases in which there are such findings hasn't really decreased very much over the years. To, to many people's surprise, we still nowadays find unexpected things after doing autopsy. So the autopsy remains a very important tool for pathologists in particular and you know, doctors in general to learn about what, what was going on with a patient and also to help them learn for the future in dealing with patients in the future. Okay, so we are dealing with a, a very important procedure that uh, is, uh, is being done less and less in our hospital. Uh, we, we didn't know that you had the same problem. Uh, it's my understanding that the problem is pretty universal. <laughs> um, it, autopsy is, is, in many places, a lost art. Uh, you know, when I, when I was training, when I was in my residency, I was only required to take part in 50 autopsies. But my professors, who trained a few decades earlier, were, were required to do at least 100. And just over the few decades, the requirements have decreased, which really reflects how the autopsy may not be valued as much as it once was. And I can understand why, but you know, this is also you know, in many ways unfortunate because we can still learn a great deal from performing autopsies. So I'm, I want to ask you some questions um, about your topic, your lecture that we're going to give you uh, to us on Friday. Uh, here in, um, in Huancayo and in all, the, all other parts of the country, uh, we used to uh, order some tests for patients who come with uh, consum consumption syndrome, uh, weight loss, undernourishment, and we sometimes believe that they can have cancer. So we order these uh, uh, biomarkers or tumor markers, CA125 CA or PSA, and other ones. Uh, what, what do you think about this, uh, these tests? Uh, uh, how do you view them? Maybe they are not useful, or maybe they are, or they can help the clinicians to take a decision. What's your opinion? Well, I do think th I think they very much do have a use. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to take the entire to use those those markers as one part of the entire patient's picture. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, you know, PSA can be very useful in the detection of prostate cancer, but a large percentage of elevated PSAs are not due to prostate cancer. In fact, of the many factors that can increase your PSA, cancer is actually one of the less frequent causes. Um, there, there, are you know, there are many other things, for instance, um, prostatitis, in a, you know, an infection or an inflammation of, of the prostate is likelier to raise your PSA. Um, that's actually where pathologists come in. If you have an elevated biomarker, and if you have a suspicion of a cancer in a particular organ, that's, you know, you can take a biopsy 
and you know send it to you know someone like a pathologist like me who can confirm whether or not this person does indeed have cancer. Um, after you've confirmed a diagnosis of cancer and then have treated the patient, these biomarkers remain useful. For instance, um, for PSA, for instance, after you've treated somebody for prostate cancer, you can monitor how well they've responded to the treatment by continuing to monitor their PSA. You know, does it, you know, you know has it dropped to zero? Is it rising? Is it dropping? And those things will help, help you determine if the treatment is working, has the cancer been eradicated, is the, you know, has the cancer spread and perhaps surgery did not get it all, um, is it coming back, has it spread. Um, biomarkers can give you a very good idea of that. So they are useful but in some settings? Um, they are useful but they should also be used in conjunction mm -hmm. with many other tests, radi radi radiography um, and also very importantly biopsy because that's the last word. You know, if you can take a piece of tissue that you suspect of being cancerous and you can send it to pathology and they, they can tell you, you know, hopefully, yes or no, that this patient does or does not have cancer. Uh, I, we want to ask you uh, another question uh, about your lecture, the other lecture. You're going to talk about interstitial lung disease mm -hmm. and uh, this is a, a, a very important uh, disease here in Huancayo. We have uh, patients uh, uh, that have uh, that are coal, coal workers that have working mines, or they were exposed to silicium, or there are women housewives that uh, cook with wood, and they develop uh, this interstitial lung disease plus COPD. But we have this problem that uh, uh, we don't uh, biopsy commonly, mm -hmm. and uh, pulmonologists are a little bit scared of uh, doing a biopsy. And uh, in interstitial lung disease, uh, as we know, it has uh, like uh, dozens of causes, different causes. Do you do this uh, in your hospital lung biopsies, or and what uh, what etiology is the most common of the well, interstitial lung disease? Um, sometimes, sometimes we do biopsies, and sometimes we do not. Um, I'm a pathologist. I don't I don't treat the patients directly. But um, in the course of preparing this lecture, I have spoken to pulmonologists I know who tell me that um, biopsy is not always necessary. A strong clinical suspicion of what's going on and it correlates with the radiographic findings and all the other clinical findings, you know, it, if, if, the, if the picture makes perfect sense for what the patient is suffering, they often do not do biopsies. If the, clinical, if, if the clinical and radiographic picture really points to a specific etiology for their disease, you know, coupled with, you know, the fact that a patient has known exposure, you know, to, to, to something, say coal or silica that is known to cause interstitial lung disease, they may not biopsy. Um, if a patient has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that generates a very specific picture radiographically. So they, they you know, so if if the if the picture fits, if the clinical picture and the radiographic picture fit, they they might not do a biopsy, and that and and, and that's understandable. So um, finally, I want to ask uh, you if you can uh, give us some words for our our students you know, to encourage them to study medicine and what? How do you see your work as a physician or a pathologist? How do you see medicine and what do you, your opinion about this profession? So uh, just uh, to motivate our, uh, our students to go on to continue with their studies. Continue your studies. Um, I love being a doctor. Um, it was difficult when I was doing it, but now that I'm done, I'm very happy that I chose this profession. Um, it makes me feel great that I can do people some good. Even though as a pathologist, I don't treat the patients directly, uh, you know, I work in an office in a microscope, often very far removed from patients, but I still know that I'm doing them some good, and that makes me feel great. And when I was a medical student, it seemed like this part, you know, this point would never come. I would never graduate. I would never finish all my training. I trained for six years after graduating from medical school, and it seemed like I would never be a working doctor. But now that I am, I love it. Oh, that was a great message. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Gaynor. Thank you, my pleasure.